Hello my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. So guys, there is nothing new under the sun, but there is something old that we do not know or perhaps we haven't realized or tied together. And we have been doing a lot of studying of ancient mythologies again. I mean, this has been something I've done my entire life. And as I've shared with you guys, you know, I first um, started getting into the Bible when I was five years old after the death of my brother who was 16 and just having to understand as much as I can about the afterlife and you know what happens afterwards so as a five-year-old boy I was handing the Bible and a Catholic Missal because I grew up Catholic uh, to my neighbor who was eight and she could read and she would read to me and uh, we would actually hide behind my parents bed which was like um, kitty corner against the wall and she would just read to me uh, different passages from the Bible that I would pick out for her to read so I could get a better understanding. And then I would, when I was able to read it on my own, I did ever since, you know, I was a little, little kid. And I read it cover to cover, made a point of going from start to finish, reading every little bit of it at 11 years old. And so I've also studied every other religion I can think of. And of course, including the Pseudepigrapha, Nag Hammadi, the Dead Sea Scrolls, all those texts as well. And especially now, you know, as, as time has gone on, I've gone deeper and deeper into the Eastern traditions. Uh, although I did read a lot of the Eastern traditions in my 20s as well. So there is nothing new under the sun, but there's a whole lot that most people haven't put together. And when we look at the comparative mythology, we, re we recognize that these stories are borrowed and retold time and time and time again. They are trying to get across some universal truths, and yet each time they're retold, uh, s most people <laughs> will think that they're hearing it for the first time, but it's not the first time. It's almost never the first time, and we don't even know if our most ancient sources are just a, a retelling maybe 30 or 100 times over of the same stories going farther and farther back. One of them that's so fascinating is the story of the founding of Rome, and one of the founders of Rome, Romulus, that's where we get Rome from, and his twin brother Remus is a fascinating one. As you see them suckling from a she-wolf who had saved them, uh, and you know, according to the story, they wouldn't have made it if, if it wasn't for the compassion of the she-wolf finding them. And the other circumstances getting to where she had to rescue them is pretty fascinating. So you might think that the only virgin birth there is in legends and myths is, is that of Christ, but you would be mistaken. There are bir virgin births throughout, and... You know, there's been some documentaries done on this, and then there's blankets. Uh, there's people that will come out and make a blanket statement saying, you know, that's all been found to be wrong, but it's not the case. It's not the case at all. You have to investigate each myth on its own merit. And so, very fascinating, too, because what is a virgin birth in the same time? You know, if we look at the modern UFO experiment uh, experience, which is an experiment, of abduction, we see its centers around tracing DNA, genetic lineage, and the manipulation of DNA. And, you know, that is a fascinating subject in and of itself. And there have been thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of people that have been abducted throughout the course of history. And then, of course, there are those that say that's just mass hysteria, hallucinations. There, there's no such things as ETs. The Earth is flat. We're the only ones living in this universe. You know, and God's up there on the cloud playing his harp, waiting for us all to wake up. Yet, when we look at things, there is a pattern that's unmistakable. So, it's fascinating to see that Romulus and Remus are the product, according to the mythology, of a union between Mars, the god of war, and Reyes, uh, Rhea, who, as the mother of these two, was actually a Vestal Virgin. So she was actually sent away to a, con a convent and was thought to be a virgin when she had the impregnation, the visit from Mars, so was it, does that still make it a virgin birth? Well, or was she just covering up because she was having an affair with somebody? You know, all these things, it's up to the 
It's up to each one of us to make a decision on what we think is true. Where, does, where is the myth coming from? What's it trying to tell us? So we see one on the knee and one about to suckle on the breast. And again, you know, they would not have been had it not been for this she-wolf as they were found after being sent down a river in a basket, just like Moses. Really, that's pretty interesting, is it not? You know, there's that same story that ties into this. So remember when they found the baby Moses uh, on the Nile? After being, you know, cast off. Well, Romulus and Remus were put in a basket and cast off. Thought was they would die. Thought with Moses they would die. Same thing. Rescued. Who else? Well, we see, you know, one of the great myths of all time that dates back at least 6,000 BC, at least 8,000 years ago, is, and it's one of the core myths of ancient ancient Egypt, and so it concerns the gods Seth, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Seth and Horus, I mean, Seth and I, Osiris, I should say, were brothers. And, and they, they fight. And remember this, too, because we're going to see more similarities later on. So they fight. It results in the death of Osiris, who is basically the first of the dying and resurrection gods. And, you know, it, he impregnated his wife, Isis, beforehand, who gives birth to Horus, who happens to be the falcon-headed god of kingship. And when Seth learned that his brother's offspring had been born, he sought to kill the baby, so Isis puts him in a basket in the Nile, sends him off. Okay, so that's obviously either a big coincidence with Moses or perhaps it's a rehash of the same story again. Everybody has to make up their own mind. Osiris, Isis, and Horus, as we say, you know, these legends go back 6,000 years before any, any scriptural writings that we have. So, biblical, scriptural, Abrahamic tradition, scriptural. So, they're far, far, far older. And as we go deeper, we see that what we get out of the Abrahamic traditions is a rehashing of Sumerian legends and Egyptian uh, mythology as well. But perhaps they're all actually given to us from an even more ancient source. And here we see Isis suckling Horus, who has a very human head at this point. Because again, recognize too that things are kind of titles as well. Titles. Like when we say Jesus Christ, we're actually, you know, when we're saying Christ, we're saying the anointed one. Anointed with what? Well, anointed from above with the Holy Spirit. And there's more to it as well. Perhaps the awakened one, just like with Buddha, we could you know, make reference to that, the fact that he understood the nature of reality as we're looking at Jesus and Mary reflect a, a very, very similar picture reflected uh, to Isis and Horus. And again, timelines, you know, you see the worship of Osiris began way back, 8,000 years ago, 8,000 thousand years ago so far in the past and so the twins are found they are saved and uh, they are raised up nobody knows who they are and they are royal blood by the way just like Moses just like Horus they're of royal lineage and in fact one could say demigods and they grow up to be exemplary young men that are so good at everything they do. Everything just kind of falls, you know, go, falls their way time and time again. And they get stronger and more powerful. And they're still unified. And then they start to get the ego uh, kick in. And they look to s establish a uh, city, a new city that will be their their capital, their homeland. And so they disagree on this. And so where they were found was an area of seven hills. And they disagreed upon which hill to build their capital, their city. And so Romulus preferred Palatine Hill above the Lupercal, and Remus preferred Aventine Hill. When they could not resolve their dispute, they agreed to seek the gods' approval through a contest of augury. Remus first saw six auspicious birds, but soon afterwards Romulus saw twelve. 
and claim to a one divine approval. So Remus said, well, I saw them first, and Romulus said, well, I saw more. Eventually, it came to blows, and what ended up happening was that Romulus killed Remus. And when you think of that, that makes me think so much of the, you know, the biblical story of Cain and Abel, and, you know, Cain killing Abel. And, you know, Romulus ends up establishing Rome, which goes on to be the great Roman Empire, which truly hasn't ever stopped. And it's it still continues. So when you think about it, and it makes sense, you know, look at the United States today. Look at the Roman Empire then. Look at the British Empire in between. And look at the Holy Roman Empire in between, you know, in the period of Char- Charlemagne. And we go through all these different rulers like Constantine forming the uh, Christian faith, the modern Christian faith, uh, which all of Christianity of today flows out of, even though it has branched and morphed into over a thousand branches. So we see it, it, it's never really changed, and it still is creating the lens that we view the world from. These stories really affect us in a bigger way than most people realize. And so when we see the manner at which our society views things and how it goes about things, well, it does kind of go about, you know, in Western tradition as if it was founded by the offspring of the God of War, right? How many nations is the U.S. in? The the, the U.S. has had wars 91, 92% of the time since its founding. It's a continuation of the Roman Empire as we see uh, Cain and Abel. And Cain was offering sacrifices of produce, vegetables, and fruit, grain, harvest, and uh, was rejected where Abel was offering blood sacrifice and was accepted. Yeah, well, blood sacrifice, well, if it is the god of war, then that would make sense, would it not? Because war is a blood sacrifice. And we see the lamb the ram, right? And, we, and we've and we heard of that so many times, the Lamb of God coming from the biblical. And it's also a reference to the age in which all, you know, a lot of these stories are referring to the age of Aries. You know, before that we had the bull and we looked at Mithras and Mithras we could see is a Christ-like figure and Mithras slays the bull and the bull is the age of Taurus, which predates the age of Aries and then is superseded by the age of Pisces, which is the age of Christianity, which is really a continuation, again, of all these other ages. You see, the stories keep morphing and keep uh, changing, but it's really the same stories. And so it's, it's fascinating to see that the symbology changes, but we're given the same power structure. And it's so fascinating to see that the similarities abound again. You know, Romulus and Remus in the basket down the river. Osiris and Isis with their son. You know, Osiris is slain and, you know, Horus is put in the basket down the river Nile. Moses down the river Nile in a basket. Over and over and over these stories go. And, you know, it's just fascinating to see this. And Rhea was a vestal virgin and thereby had a vow of chastity. And it was all about the fact that, that really it was all to keep her, to prevent her from giving birth to po- potential claimants to the throne. And, of course, she ended up bearing Romulus and Remus, fathered by the war god Mars. And so Amelius Amal- ordered the infants drowned in the Tiber River. And so the trow in which they were placed, floated down the river, came to rest to the site of the future Rome, where they were suckled by a she-wolf. Interesting stuff. It's just fascinating. The similarities between Roman and Christian religious propaganda, this is, um, this is, again, just tying things together, and we can see it. You know, we can see it. So they, they've used these stories to control our mindsets, but the stories are really the same. They're just a, a retelling time and time again. What happened to Romulus. Well, there was this mist. Uh, you know, he, he went and he did a lot of conquering and created an empire. And then there was this mist that came. 
and then all of a sudden he was gone. He was taken up into the heavens. And the stories are that he even became a god. Wow, taken unto the heavens, who has walked with uh, God and was gone? Well, we see that, is, right? We see Enoch. Yeah, you know, we, we, we've seen Enoch taken up and we see Elijah and they become Sandalphon and Metatron. So again, these legends, these myths, they are all so similar time and time and time again. And, you know, really the sons of a god. And then, of course, the Christians will say, it's well, that he's the son of the, the one god, the only god. And there again, you know, it, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that there is no god. Because, you know, it, it, I personally do believe there is a source of, of all, one source, but... It, I think that source, in my mind, after studying all these different traditions, including the Eastern ones, in the Eastern ones, it's clear, you know, for Taoism says, the Tao that can't be named is not the, is not the real Tao. So the source is way beyond an individual. It's way beyond being masculine and feminine. Source contains masculinity and femininity, as, as there's been some that said there's growing up in this um, patriarchal tradition, uh, which if all this really is coming out of uh, Ares, you know, the god of war, this whole patriarchal system that we're in, which is definitely centered on war, then it would make sense, you know, that the divine feminine is downplayed and the balance is, is not there. And we've seen that because we've talked about the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit, and, you know, even when we look back, we see Asherah and Yahweh, because originally the Jews did worship a goddess aspect with Yahweh. Uh, but that was put down and that was subjugated and was turned into a heresy. And that type of thing has happened time and time again as well. These similarities are just incredible. And it, it points that we once again are getting an old myth in, in a new light. So when we look at it from the point of view of, well, well, how would you view this from, say, an Eastern perspective? And, and, you know, that is that the source, the real God, lies within everything. Again, if God is omnipotent, right, all-powerful and omniscient, all-knowing, and also everywhere, omnipresent, then it's got to be in the masculine and the feminine. That's just a given. And it's got to be in you, me, and everything that is its creation. And that's just a given. Because if, if it wasn't, it wouldn't be omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. That's just obvious. So it's fascinating to see these things. So Romulus is taken up into the heavens. And, you know, just like Elijah and Enoch before him. There are so many of these myths that all tie together. And yet each time they come along, you know, the believers in them believe that they got the truth for the first time ever. But they're they're giving you allegories. The you know, they're also hinting towards a truth that it's up for the individual to see. So when he's and, and there's a lot of writings to, you know, to this as opposed to some of the newer stories as well. So the poet Ovid, in his Metamorphosis, left us the most artistic account of the most fantastic version of Romulus's end mentioned by the historians. According to this story, Romulus didn't die a natural death, but was brought to heaven by his divine father Mars, where he became a god named Curinus. His wife, Hercilla, followed him soon and became a goddess, Hora. Interesting, is it not? So Mars comes back for his own. So what are we saying here? Is it all astrotheology? Or is this the return of an Anunnaki, you know, those that come from the heavens and taking a human away on his spaceship? Or did he learn the mysteries enough that he could actually ascend 
and go into a higher dimension. Again, it's up to each of us, you know, to decide what we believe. But it does one well to actually do some studying, to come to the conclusions without just trusting one version as we see how these myths are universal. As always, my friends, thank you for your support on Ko-Fi and Patreon. God bless and namaste.